Hey guys, thanks for joining us for this 156th episode in Season 2 of Good Questions with Cameron Dole. Special guests on this episode include actor Patrick Muldoon. He's starring in Deadlock, which is in theaters, on demand, and digital tomorrow, December 3rd. We'll also visit with lead singer of Vanilla Fudge, Mark Stein. He's got a single and lyric video for his version of the Temptations classic, Ball of Confusion. And we'll visit with Alex Baber from Cold Case Consultants of America. It's a new company that was formed solely to work on difficult cold cases, uncovering new evidence and leads with the goal of bringing answer to more victims and their families. Of course, if you would, please take the time to subscribe, comment, leave some feedback, check out the shop, and of course, share with your friends. Now, when you were a kid, did you ever open a Christmas present from your grandparents, see that it was bath towels, and have your grandmother say, now that you're growing up, you'll need towels? Well, you're not alone. According to a new poll, more than half of kids have been left unimpressed by a Christmas present, and 41% have been disappointed by a gift that was on their list. Now, 33% of parents admit they bought their kids something that they were indifferent about, but they say kids are most likely to be disappointed by gifts from their grandparents, uncles and aunts, friends, and neighbors. All right, guys, promised you another very special guest. We've talked about the movie that's going to be in theaters on demand and digital coming up tomorrow. Deadlock, and uh, we've got the star Patrick Muldoon with us today. And first off, Patrick, really appreciate you taking some time, brother. Uh, come on, Cameron. Thank you for having me. How are you? I, I'm well. And like I mentioned before we came on, excited about uh, the release. Been talking, uh, talked to Michael a couple of weeks ago, and he kind of delved into you guys' backstory as well. So uh, what was it like seeing him the first day on set? It was just, uh, it, it was incredible. It was like, you know, because we hadn't seen each other since, since the 90s. You know, and he's like, Patrick Michael, I'm like, oh my God. So, you know, there was some time between uh, when we worked with each other last. And, um, but it was wonderful to see him and, uh, you know, and, and also for us both, you know, to act together with Bruce Willis, you know, which was a treat for both of us. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and like that. And like that, man. It was, uh, I think for both of us, we were kind of pinching ourselves because of the whole Bruce Willis aspect of it. You know, you get the call, you get the, you get the call to work with one of your, uh, with a legend who you've admired, and maybe the, one of the reasons why you became an actor in the first place. And you know, I think when Die Hard came out, I was, I was in college, you know. So, uh, and and part of my. Uh, preparation for this, I wanted to know why everyone, you know, why we all love Bruce Willis. So I just watched all the diehards, you know, and, and, uh, and you get like, even though there's tons of bad guys and Bruce is killing all the bad guys, he still seems to be having fun. And I, and, you know, and, or, or with a tongue in cheek to it or, or with humor. And I think that's what we really tried to do with this. Uh, was, was kind of weave those elements on, uh, on why we love those movies. Uh, and, and, and if we're having fun, hopefully the audience will have fun with this as well. So, so hopefully, uh, so hopefully it comes across. And Patrick, how, what was the biggest challenge for you getting into the skin of a, of a retired Army Ranger? I mean, what was your prep for the role? It was, you know, it was talking to Army Rangers, but it was, it was also there's like a, a lot of great stuff online about uh, how these guys relate to each other afterwards, right? Because they've seen so much, right? So, uh, you know, things we, we, people that were not in the military never want to see. But there's a, there was a kind of a, a piece to them once they get out and uh, it, it, which I wanted to bring to this guy so that you know he, he's seen so much in his life he, he just wants peace you know he's, he's well loved at work which you get from the movie and everybody loves uh, Matt Carr 
and then stuff goes wrong, and he's got to kill people again, and he's not happy about it. Yeah, I even apologize to some people after I have to off them for trying to, like, open, you know, these militants trying to open up this dam and, and kill, you know, tens of thousands of people. So, <laughs> so that's kind of the, instead of the, you know, kind of the classic ex-hard military guy, uh, that's what's different about Matt Carr. He's uh, got a good sense of humor to him, you know, and, and I wanted to bring that in because those Bruce Willis movies, you know, John McClane has a great sense of humor to him, and that's why we love those movies. So so uh, we try to have much uh, fun as much as possible amidst, you know, all, all the bullets. And Patrick, what look looking back as as you get ready for release day tomorrow? I mean, what is going to be your your overwhelming takeaway from working with Bruce on the project? Um, it, it, the overwhelming thing was uh, you get there and all of a sudden, you know, the guy that you've been watching on TV is standing in front of you, but uh, he's been doing this so long. But once once they say action, he's so present. And uh, with you, that he draws you into the scene, you know. And that was, you know, that that was my takeaway. I'm like, that, you know, uh, that's what you call a pro. You know, that no matter what, he comes to play, and you better be on your A game because even after uh, Bruce uh, doing this quite a bit, uh, he brings his A game no matter what, and uh, that, that was a big lesson for me. Uh, it'll always show up ready to rock because, uh, you know, Bruce Willis comes to play, so so, so did I. So, and that, that's what makes it fun, you know? That's awesome. And again, the, the new film, Deadlock in Theaters, on demand and digital, coming up tomorrow. Patrick, always want to make sure and let our listeners know where they can find, uh, find the movie tomorrow, and then, of course, everything you've got going social media-wise as well, brother. Uh, thanks. I'm uh, on Instagram. I'm the Patrick Muldoon on Instagram. Uh, at Pat, at Patrick on Twitter. Come check me out. The the movie's available everywhere. Uh, most streaming services, and it's also uh, in some theaters in in the major cities. Um, but uh, anyway, you know, everyone watches Die Hard at Christmas, so now they can watch Die Hard and Deadlock. So please check this out. That's awesome. Well, Patrick, brother, it's been great to catch back up with you, sir. Looking forward to the movie this weekend, and uh, hopefully we can catch up again in the new year. Hey, man, I would love it. Thank you so much, Kellen. Now, someone asked young people to name old people trends that they'd like to get rid of. And here are a few things that boomers do that young people hate. Number one, claiming the customer is always right. Employees should be allowed to stand up for themselves if someone's being unreasonable. Number two, the workhorse mentality at most jobs. Going above and beyond is great, but shouldn't be expected all the time, especially at low-paying jobs. Number three, acting like it's fine to be bad at technology. Just because you're older doesn't mean you can't learn the basics. One person said their dad refuses to use computers, but still makes them buy things on Amazon and Google stuff for him as well. Number four, popping in for a visit. Young people always call first or more likely text. Number five, calling instead of texting, unless it's an emergency. Young people hate random phone calls because it feels like they have to answer. So it's like you're forcing them to talk, but they don't have to respond to texts right away. Number six, making people feel bad for not owning a house yet. It's way harder than it used to be, and lots of parents and grandparents don't seem to get that. And seven, all the participation trophy jokes. Sure, young people got them, but their parents and grandparents handed them out, so who's really to blame? A new single and lyric video for the Temptations classic, Ball of Confusion. We've got Mark Stein on with us. You might remember him as the voice of Vanilla Fudge. Mark, first off, a privilege to visit with you, brother. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah, it's it's great to be here this morning, and I hope uh, everybody's uh, doing well and 
feeling safe out there in uh, Oklahoma. Uh, <laughs> now, uh, now, Mark, tell us where where the inspiration to release the Temptations classic, Ball of Confusion. What was so special about this song for you personally? Well, um, I had produced uh, you know a bunch of songs for a movie called Rock and the Wall, which uh, <clears throat> which is a, a documentary uh, about the uh, about rocks influence on the fall of the Berlin Wall and communism, okay? And uh, ball of confusion, you know, the lyrics seem to fit in with uh, the climate of uh, what was going on over there. So I had it in the can, you know, and ironically, uh, I was putting an album together, looking for songs to put together, and uh, and that one came up, and uh, I, I just seemed to, like, hey, you know, the lyrics from back in the 70s, you know, they seem like they're almost exactly relevant today as they were back then. And the track really was kicking butt, and it sounded really, really great to my manager and everybody that heard it. And said, well, "Let's, let's, 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 uh, let's release that as part of the album. You know, there's a light, so, and it fits in with the uh, the theme of the record too. So, that's how that came about." And Mark, how how many times do you see that in music over the the history of your career that you've been involved in the industry, seeing how much the music can go past beyond just the here and now to generations beyond afterwards as well? Well, I mean, in retrospect, uh, if you look back over the decades, not a whole heck of a lot of stuff has changed as far as social issues and uh, you know political issues and what have you. Uh, I don't. I don't know if we uh, do a good job learning from our mistakes because we seem to be, uh, you know, repeating them over and over again. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, I, I was, uh, I was torn in the late '60s. You know, when we were having racial divide when Martin Luther King was at the helm, and I can remember when when he was assassinated and torn in the South, and and all of that uh, mayhem was going on. And uh, I don't know. Here we are. Fast forward a half a century later, and it seems like we're still de- dealing. And just in different ways, but we're still dealing with political and social issues, and now we're dealing with health issues. And, uh, you know, we're, this country is obviously still in a pretty deep divide right now. And uh, it's kind of painful for me, you know, that things haven't really improved on that level. And that's kind of like what was the inspiration for writing and putting all these together for uh, an album for There's a Light. And because the album deals with love and patriotism and social issues that we've all been dealing with with a positive message, you know, going forward uh, to uh, hope to stay on a spiritual side and, and, and heal each other over time. For you, what was it that, that made you so excited about uh, sharing your first solo album? What And why, why, why took so long, Mark? Um, well, uh, again, I, I, I had, I've, I've had these songs recorded for a number of years, and I never had an outlet for them. Um, and when I, I wrote a song called We Are One, which reflects the pandemic that I wrote back in 2020 in April, uh, you know, it uh, came out to be a real emotional production that people are really taken to. And I went to try and get a, uh, maybe release it as a single, but most of the companies didn't want to do that. They, at first I, I said, well, let's put out an EP, you know, and, well, that might be cool, but do, do you have a whole album? That would be great. And then I, I started digging into my past over the last few years, and I had songs I had written, like All Lives Matter and uh, songs like Racism. And of course, We Are One. We, I had the reimagined version of Ball of Confusion. Then I had covers of uh, America the Beautiful that I had put together, and, uh, and uh, the, the Rascals, People Gotta Be Free. And I think we said, wait a minute, all these songs... They they all you know kind of thread into this uh, into this message, and uh, ironically they all fit together in that direction, and uh, that's what led to to this album. You know I I had solo efforts before in the past, but I never had anything actually on a label as a solo artist uh, that was you know released. So that's what led to it all. Now, Mark, talk about the the limited edition bundles. While those are are still available, are some of those still available on the uh, on the store as well? Yeah, yeah, they've got really cool shirts. There's a light, it's a great great shirts and uh, bracelets with the song titles on it. And you got my book is in there. You keep me hanging on. The raging story of rock music's golden age, and uh, it's a, it's a very cool uh, bunch of items. You can get at a good price and. Uh, I think Mark Stein fans and Vanilla Fudge fans ought to get them, especially with the Christmas holidays coming up. I think it would be 
be a nice uh, stock and stuffer and a nice uh, arrangement underneath the tree. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's good. And again, there you go. My salesman comes through, right? <laughs> again, the uh, the album. There's a light, and uh, we got the new single and the video as well. And Mark, want to make sure and let folks know where they can keep up with uh, with the music, the socials, the website, all of that as well. Yeah, well, my website is mark dot com, but you can get. Uh, all my records, you can get There's a Light on all the major, you know, social, you know, all the digital platforms like uh, Apple Music and iTunes and, uh, you know, just wherever you can find, you know, uh, contemporary music today, wherever you get it, it's going to be on uh, those same places. And it's going to be also be on Walmart website and Target's website, and uh, and there you go. So um, I appreciate the support. And, uh I'm proud of this record, and it's getting great reviews, and I hope people uh, check it out. That's right. And again, uh, check out the single and the uh, lyric video ball of confusion. Mark, it's been great to visit with you today, sir. I, I hope you have a great rest of your week and look forward to catching up again. Okay, man. You stay well, okay? If you hit the ground running after school, got married, and had kids, you may wonder when life will finally slow down. Well, it might be sooner than you think. In a new survey, the average person expects the pace of life to slow down at age 43. The survey also found that the average adult gets just seven and a half hours to themselves every week or a little over an hour a day when they aren't doing any work or chores. Now, those who have slowed down already say that their life is roughly 53% better than before and 39% of people admit to feeling envious of those who live life at a slower pace. Cold Case Consultants of America, we've got Alex Baber with us today. And uh, Alex, Cold Case Consultants, where did where did this first come up for you in the first place? Well, initially it started in 2007, the concept, uh, before I, even before I met my wife. Uh, I was contacted by a serial killer that I had uh, exposed that was still active called my cell phone, tracked down my information. And uh, after speaking with him on the phone, we kind of went off grid. Me and my family did for a few years, just for safety purposes. And then uh, me and my wife connected and uh, her having a forensic background, cyber forensic, and also a forensic psychology background now. And with my background as a PSO, private security officer, that's what I love to do, protect people and and do what's right for uh, the community. We kind of came together and uh, we started looking at these cases and uh, they just started falling in our laps. And with today's technology, as you know, it's advanced so much uh, in comparison to even a decade ago. And some of these cases are 70, 60, 50 years old. So this is we're basically taking a case that was never looked at from our perspective and starting from square one. And it's just a, a whole new enlightenment. I mean, we're able to do the the new uh you know, forensic uh, testing for audio spectrum analysis for any recordings that they have. We have the fingerprint latent matches now with the digital software. You know, they, they can like that instantly uh, match a fingerprint. It's great. And uh, we're applying this new technology to these old cases. And while we're doing this, we're getting these hits, these registered returns. And it's one of those, you know, aha moments when you, you know, when it comes back, you're like, holy crap, this is just really <laughs> back. So, you know, and it's been really, really great. And some of these cases are really, really, uh, you know, old and infamous cases that have never been reviewed, you know, so that's how we pretty much got started. And that's, that's our, uh, our background. Now, cold cases and uh, true crime, those are, those make excellent bedfellows for a podcast host. So I'm excited to go and to delve into both of those a little bit. What, what is it specifically about cold cases that reached into your heart and really grabbed a hold of you? Okay. So um, growing up uh, in Northern Florida, Eileen Worlds, her last victim, uh, she had left his body just, you know, within miles of my residence as a child, you know, like, uh, I think it was in like three miles. And, uh, you know, when all that came out, I'm like, wow, you know, this, she was early in our backyard. Uh, and, and that kind of intrigued me. And uh, when I was young, girls was diagnosed with perceptionism, which is a medical term they no longer use. So I have this ability, it's a, um, a neurodiversity is what they label it now. So when I look at, say, a letter from, a, from an anonymous letter from a, a murderer or a serial killer, or if I look at, say, a cipher or a code or anything, you know, even a crossword puzzle, my mind processes and connects things on a different level. 
than the average individual. So I'm able to associate things that other people overlook. And with doing that and having the ability to create the new uh, database that we have for all these letters, we collect the letters all the way back to 1944 for an unapprehended uh, serial killers or murderers. And wow. honestly, they have mailed letters to say the press, law enforcement, victims, families, and create this database. And we uh, set it up so when we run the linguistics uh, across the board and we look for syntax, context, you know, um, location, anything that, that can correlate, it sends back a register return to us. And when we get that, we're able to look closer at the file to see if there's some kind of validity here. And when we're doing this, I mean, we're opening doors that have never been opened before. And it's a whole new experience. You know, law enforcement's reached out to us. Victims' families have reached out to us. Uh, we're, we're making leaps and bounds here. And it's, it's wonderful to help these victims' families. Now, you talked about technology. And uh, how crazy is it to be able to reach into some of those old footage, like you said, 60, 70 years back, and be able to use the new technology to give some answers that folks have been looking, that they've given up on before? It's it's literally, uh, it's, it's insane that, you, that this is happening. You know, it's we've advanced so much just in the last, you know, 20, 30 years. It, it's almost as if, the case just happened yesterday and we're able to use the new advancement uh, in forensics to literally uh, identify, uh, locate, and then even, you know, close these cases that have been, been stagnant, have been cold without anybody really pursuing them. Somebody said one of these cases is 76 years old that we're working on. Wow. And, and the victims, the original um, victims, family members, the you know, mother, father, sister, brother uh, are deceased, but you have the second generation that are still, you know, in support are trying to get answers and when you pick up the phone, you call them and say, hello, you know, I'm Alex Baver from Cold Case Assaults of America. We've been working this case, uh, knowing, knowing you, and we found this new evidence. It's that moment when, you you know, they drop the phone or, you know, and they're like, oh, my God, well, thank God. And, you know, this is wonderful. This is great. What do you have? And we present the evidence to them. And, uh, you know, it changes a person's life. It, r- it really, really does. It's a shame that we can't get the answers to, you know, the, the ones that have passed on. Because, you know, that's that's something very hard to carry. I could, I could never imagine to be honest with you, Cameron. It's, uh, you know, I speak to a lot of these victims' families, mothers especially, and when there's a child involved, you know, whenever you sit down, and I've said this before, and you have a, a open heart discussion with them, they give you a piece of themselves. And, and in return, you give a piece back, you know, there's a connection there. And, uh, you know, to hear somebody say, you know, last time I saw my daughter, you know, she got up and I, I gave her her lunch for the day and she went to the school bus and someone abducted her. You know, and then they found her remains where they never found her at all. Uh, it's it's life changing. So it feels really good to be able to do this. It's, it's definitely, uh, you know, a life's uh, vision and fulfillment. And when, when you think of the cold cases, I mean, uh, what is it that uh, that gives the families hope? What spurs the request that you get the most often? Well, I mean, our, our attitude, basically, you know, we don't take no for an answer. I've assembled what they're referring to in the media as the super team. You know, I have Kurt Baggett, the number one forensic document examiner in the nation. Uh, I have Detective Patrick Cohen from uh, Atlanta. He's an uh, officer of the year award winner, and award winner. He's got plenty of accommodations, uh, just a ton of them, highly respected. Um, I have Dr. Arpad Voss, who's one of the leading uh, forensic anthropologists in the, in the country. I have a Hall of Fame inductee for reporter, broadcast, and documentarian, and Joe uh, Cochran. And, you know, I assembled this team. They're all handpicked. And what we're doing here is we're just making sure that when we break these these older cases down, especially the expertise of each individual's use is maximized. And, you know, again, with the software that's available, it's kind of a double one-two punch here. And it's been, it's been, it's been again, uh, it's life-changing, not just for us and our company, but for the victims and their families and law enforcement. I've been very open and very grateful. When you're covering these cold cases, how hard is it for you not to get down on the state of the world that we live in when you're going through some of these cases? Well, uh, to be personally, or, uh, perfectly honest with you, personally, it's very hard because, you know, since 1980 alone, statistics have proven the federal government released them that there's over a quarter million cold cases that are just strictly homicides. Not wow. abductions, disappearances, just homicides. Quarter of a million. 
one percent of those cameron ever gets solved up wow. to this date one percent do the math let us set in there's a lot of victims families out there and a lot of pain a lot of answers that have not been provided and it's not law enforcement's fault i'm, I'm not saying there aren't uh, situations where the investigative could have uh, been furthered or had been handled differently but the biggest concern here is that only of the 19,000 plus agencies out there, only 7% have a cold case squad, 7% mm. of 19,000. Wow. So they just don't have the manpower. And the biggest problem is they don't have the annual funding. So another thing we're doing, we're kind of doing a call of action here where we want, we're reaching out to the state government, federal government for funding and not for us because we, we do not receive any funds from victims' families or any agencies. We have our own private investors. We have almost a quarter million dollars investors' monies that are helping us do this. Wow. And, um, you know, these we're doing this because they have to allocate these funds so that these, especially these small um, agencies, uh, you know, on, on the local level, townships, uh, city, town, uh, they have to have somebody that has a pair of eyes on these cases. They have to. You know, even if it's just one one detective, one investigator, because if not, that's going to be filed away. If it's not in a box somewhere collecting dust, it's going to be put in a hard drive and forgotten. You see, and we just I, I can't stand by and my team in support of me and allow that to happen any longer. We need to intervene and mediate the situation. Now, what what would you say? I know that you've got a lot of those folks that are always worried about uh, the big brother always looking on you. Everybody thinks that everything is covered by a camera. So if if that's truly the case, then why are there cold cases? Well, uh, initially, there, there's always the the what if, meaning that, you know, the what if the original investigator or the crime scene investigator did not thoroughly do his job or was not um was not present at the time they, they, they came and they they found the initial uh crime scene you know because there's it's a paramedic show and they're trying to revive somebody i think they save somebody you know what i mean and in doing so sometimes the evidence is contaminated hmm. and in that in that case it's not necessarily the agency's fault because you're trying to save somebody's life but you know there, there's other things that go on with that too it's just there it's not just one problem this is a collective and we need to address each issue independently. And in doing so, we're actually able to pinpoint, especially on a national level now, because we're getting national coverage. We're able to pinpoint this to, to the public and let them know what they need to do to support this and support us and the victims' families. And they're doing that. The call to action has been, uh, the response has been impressive and, and moving. What do you think is the biggest misconception whenever people hear the word cold case? What do you think is the biggest misconception that folks have? Well, I mean, cold cases, a lot of people think that they're, say, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years old. That's what cold registers. You know, you think of some of these older cases like Jimmy Hoffa, you know, Jeff case has stuff like that. Um, but believe it or not, a cold case can be within a year, year and a half. You know, once the investigation reaches a standpoint to where there's no new evidence, no new leads, it's literally considered cold. Mm -hmm. And there are uh, individuals out there, prime example is the Delphi murders. You know, Superintendent Carter, wonderful man. Every time he gets up there and he speaks about these two young ladies that were abducted and murdered, you know, he, he tears up. He His heart's invested. And for the last four years, it'll be five years, um, February 15th or 14th this year, he keeps saying, I'm one piece away. I'm just one piece away, which he is. Technically, we're always one piece away. Right. You know, but he won't let go and he won't label it a cold case and God love him. You know, one of the mothers of uh, the, one of the daughters reached out to my company wanting us to look into it. And I've been open, open to that. And uh, I would like to have his support in doing so because these two young girls, you know, we have, oh, are you familiar with the case? We have audio, mm -hmm. we have video of this perpetrator coming across the railroad for the bridge, telling them, you know, down the hill. Um, there's no reason with today's technology that we cannot identify, track down, and, and apprehend this, this individual. I would love this system in doing so with my team. How hard is it for you to, to make the, the folks that come to you with the request – to put them at ease and, and let them know that you really are going to give everything that you can trying to come up with the answers. I mean, how do you deal with them on a, on a realistic level? We're always a hundred percent level with them and honest, you know, um, I've always stated that there's no such thing as the perfect crime. Uh, you know, there's always a set of eyes. There's always a fingerprint. There's always, you know, a, a fiber or a hair, something's left behind. Nothing's perfect in this world. And all I have to do is locate it. 
And again, these families, if you tell them that, you want to keep it on the level. You want to be honest with them. They've been to hell and back, you know, and they don't want to be bullshit. They want to be jerked around. Just tell them the truth. Tell them, give them the facts. Say, look, this is what we can do for you. This is what we uh, can can help you with. And if things fall into place and things go well, maybe we can solve your crime and, and, and put, give some ease. You know, there's no, they say resolve. There's no resolve. I've spoken to hundreds of victims' families, and there is no resolve, but there are answers. There are answers. And and how hard is it to to sometimes grasp that that yeah you may get the answer, but it's it, it's not necessarily going to be a healing for you. It's it's very difficult because you, you want to take the pain away from these people. You know they 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 didn't deserve what happened. Nobody does. I don't care what anybody says. You know we live in a cynical society here, and it's in our DNA as men to protect our our offspring and our women, especially. And most of these cases that we're looking at are dealing with children. Uh, You know, the the majority of my cases, like 62% of them involve children. And it's very difficult to to go down that dark hole when you're looking at the crime scene photos and the autopsy photos and reading the details in the cases. It's a very dark place. And that family lives in that constantly 24-7. And for me to give them some kind of relief, to give them some kind of, you know, a, a, a beam of light, you know what I mean? In a very, very uh, dark uh, state of mind, that that's what we attempt to do here. And we always want to be 100% honest with them. You know, if we can't help them for whatever reason, and th- that does happen, even though every case is uh, solvable in my mind, you know, if the original crime scene investigator didn't do his job, we didn't get everything together, or, you know, pieces aren't in order or missing from the files, we are just, you know, we're running uphill here. Uh, it's a never ending uh, journey that will just keep going because we'll never be able to identify the perpetrator without that information. So, but I do believe every case is solved. I believe it's out there. It's just identifying, locating it and, you know, uh, bringing it to light. What was, what was your first aha moment? The one that really gave you the boost? <laughs> the very first aha moment was with the Chicago lipstick murder. Uh, William Hirons, 4546, was convicted for uh, three heinous crimes, one, one involving a six-year-old girl by name Susan Deegan. She was kidnapped from her bedroom, ransom note was left. Uh, she was bisected between her C2, C3 vertebrae and dismembered, head removed, legs removed, arms, six years old. And her body parts were placed in sewer basins around her residence in her neighborhood. And this man uh, literally was persecuted by the media. He was found breaking out of a house, a burglary uh, attempt, got an altercation with the law enforcement officers. Uh, they roughed him up. Five days, they they literally tortured this guy. Um, they didn't give me food or water, no legal uh, representation, did not see his family. Um, they they did some really harsh stuff to this man. And he still wouldn't confess. I'm not the murderer. You know, listen, everybody, please. Your children are not safe. The perpetrator is still in the street. You know, I'm not him. And then we find out later the uh, polygraphs he took, he passed. But at that time, they said, oh, you know, it's inconclusive. You know, but then when Dr. Reed released the original polygraph exams, he passed them. So, you know, now looking back, unfortunately, William Hines was, was incarcerated for 65 years. Instant man, 65 years, long serving inmate in Illinois history. Wow. Right? Got, a B, got a BA behind bars. Okay. Not one incident report right up in 65 years. But this man kidnapped a six-year-old out of her bedroom and did all these, you know, heinous uh, acts to her. Come on. What are we doing here, guys? You know, what are we doing? So we here's the thing is there's a fingerprint on victim number two on our door jam, Ms. Francis Brown. Well, with today's technology, we're able to get that fingerprint and we were able to identify the original perpetrator. And we just announced it earlier this week in Chicago, WGN. And we're about to uh, go uh, globally on the announcement and try to exonerate Mr. Hirons after, you know, 70 years, uh, almost 80 years. But that was my first aha moment. I'm like, oh, you know, this guy... You know, God, God love him. How could you live in a, uh, you know, an eight by six cell for 65 years, knowing you're innocent and other people know you're innocent too. Here's the funny is the public got behind him on support and the um, parole board, one of the members even said in the early seventies, look, we know you're innocent. We can't let you out. And the reason they couldn't is because they were afraid that when there's a child involved in a, in a heinous crime, that the city would retaliate. You know, even 20, 30 years later, they would retaliate. You know, that's it's it's insane that something like this could happen. With our judicial system, we, we need to address this. We need to make sure uh, that we cover all the facts, all the evidence completely and not allow the media to interfere, not allow to inject opinion and assumption. We need to stick strictly to the physical facts and hard evidence. 
Now, as you look at the the, the cold cases, you look at the, the ones from farther back and look at those as they come closer to today. What do you do? You see the difference in the advances that are made that uh, that keep maybe some of the cold cases from from being coming cold cases today that would have been maybe in the past. Hundred percent. There's stuff like uh, magnetic fingerprinting instead of your fam- your infamous uh, latent print match, which is your dust. Now you have the magnetic pool, which is hundred percent more accurate. You know, and it's much easier to, uh, to to extract. And then you have you know the advances in DNA is off the chart. You know, we just got the Golden State Killer within the last few years because of genealogy. You know, we don't even have to have you. We'll track you down to your family. You know, you think you're safe, you're out there roaming these streets, right? You know, all these these crimes you committed, you think you're in the clear. Well, you're not. So, you know, we're going to use this technology, the uh, the forensic technology advanced, especially, we're going to identify, we're going to track you, we're going to hunt you down, and we're going to bring you to justice for these families. And it's a wonderful feeling. That's another good thing, you know. These guys out here are still walking the street, and they, some of them may be listening, uh, you know, that have gotten away with some, some crimes out there. Uh, I just hope your file doesn't cross my desk, because if it is, it's just a matter of time. Uh, you know, with my team and, and the abilities that we have at, at our fingertips, you know, these we, we have the ability to get on the Internet right now and type in someone's name and find out where they went to kindergarten. At. You know, literally, we have that ability. So there's just a matter of time. You know, they, they may be breathing uh, free air right now, but it just it may be a short time before they find out that they're not. And and how much you mentioned the advances in DNA and and whenever you bring up the advances in DNA, it takes me back to 1994 and 95 when we were watching the O.J. Simpson case where everybody was arguing and battling whether DNA was admissible. How much has the DNA game changed since 94, 95 time frame? Uh, it's a whole we're on a whole nother level. <laughs> Not even, you know, it, it's almost uh, it, it, to even mention that conversation is humorous at this point, you know, cause they back then anything you, anytime you introduce something new and especially in the forensics, um, you know, department, it's going to be challenged because a it's dealing with somebody's life, you know, whether it be them being incarcerated or being, you know, put on death row. So that's going to be one of the issues. Here's another one of the issues just to bring that up. If you remember like uh, the Wayne Williams case and that kid, which I'm working on that case too. And I'm fine. I found new evidence that could exonerate Wayne Williams. Wow. This is really, this is really, really uh, one of those other aha moments. At the crime scene, we've identified uh, forensic evidence that uh, they've had, but they didn't realize they had it. It's not their fault. You know, you had the GBI, FBI, and the local law enforcement agency for uh, Rock, Rockdale and Atlanta PD, uh, it, but it's been filed away because that's, you know, we found the guy, he's in prison, blah, blah, blah. Um, so this is one of those cases there where they brought, they introduced fiber uh, evidence, which is basically smoke and mirrors. It's been proven now. You know, the, the whole dog hairs and the fibers, well, the fibers came from an automobile, not a residence. And the dog hairs were canine hairs from a German Shepherd, which they used to search out these victims. <laughs> you know, there's pictures everywhere. The the, 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 uh, the German Shepherds with the victim in the presence of the victim's uh, crime scene. And these are the hairs that are, that are used to identify, <laughs> you know, come on, guys. So it, we're on a whole nother level here. And everything is like the Unabomber, Fitzgerald, one of my idols, man, great Great individual. Yeah, we've connected on Facebook. He's friends with my wife, you know, with her forensic background. And uh, I'd like to know him personally. Unfortunately, I don't. But he, he was able to track down Ted because of, uh, you know, for linguistics, which is one of the categories that I've really invested in with these these letters and this database, these serial code letters. You know, that's really directed us where we're going. And uh, he, he put that out. And then the forest, the brother identified and sister all identified. Hey, I know that, that that writing or that saying or the verbiage um, in the context. And he was able to track him down. But they were laughed at him. You know, they rejected mm-hmm. this. Game. They said, look, uh, the way a person speaks, you can identify a perpetrator. Well, absolutely. Where they're raised, you know, the, uh, the verbs that they use, whether it be Chicago or Philly or New York or Florida or California, uh, the way they word and then knowing the individual, you may not know it. I may not know it, but their friend may know it when they hear it. When you say something backwards or they misspell a word a certain way. This is another one we just discovered. Um, the Circleville letters. Circleville case. I was born in Columbus, Ohio. Are you familiar with the Circleville writer case? Mm-hmm. Okay. So we got all the uh, evidence on that. And um, the 83 letters, there was a letter which they used the spelling of, of truly, T-R-U-E-L-Y. Okay. 
if you research that, the use of that spelling is zero in American context since 1890. Not even one percent. Wow. Well, that's now get this. This is the I got a lot I need to share. I got to keep a, a cap on it. But uh, <laughs> you look at the zodiac letter, his return letter from January 29, nineteen seventy four. Right, he went off grid for for thirty four months. He spells it the same way at the bottom. Okay. So then we start looking at the logistic sides of this and those letters, and we find out that it, this traces back. You know, everybody's always associated the black dahlia with zodiac. Okay, but they never had physical evidence, right? So this database we created put us on this road where we were able to go back and, and identify new forensic evidence connecting these cases, including the Zodiac, because Ann Short, Elizabeth Short, her mm -hmm. cousin, or, or Elizabeth Short, his cousin Ann Short was the teacher in Circleville that worked with Clara Massey, wow. Gordon wife. Let that sink in. Elizabeth Short's cousin, Ann Short, from the Black Dahlia. Okay. In the letters, initial set of letters, it says, my girlfriend, do not mess with my girlfriend. Okay. So we tracked back and we found out who the individual was that dated Elizabeth Short with the DA files. Okay. This guy was uh, witnessed by three witnesses at Mark Hansen's residence. All right. At this residence, when they came in, it was uh, January 10th uh, or January 11th, excuse me, of 1947, four days before she was abducted, mutilated and murdered. In the report, they said he, he, she came in with this young gentleman, you know, uh, Darker hair, complex, a little a glib, you know, a little outspoken. And at the bottom of it, it has his name, but they didn't know his first name, but they knew his last name. Well, we found his business card and the 23 items that was mailed in by the Black Value Avenger. He mailed his own card in. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. So we got the the uh, uh, forensic evidence from, from there and we connected it. Here's a lot of things people didn't know. So the 408 cipher for the Zodiac, right? It quotes, they thought it was the most dangerous game. Mm -hmm. Okay. Original uh, about you know hunting hunting man, uh, the most dangerous animal. Okay, well, it was actually from the movie called A Game of Death, which was filmed in 1945. There was one theater that played that that movie, in all of 46, 47 in Los Angeles. It was the Marcel Theater. Marcel Theater was owned by Mark Hansen. Elizabeth Short lived with Mark Hansen on two separate occasions: October first, October twenty uh, twelfth. October 23rd to November 13th, right? Mm -hmm. Was his, in his play in his theater, it's the second feature under, under Bedlam for a period of like 28 days, okay? And that file I got from the DA said, he asked her, did you go to my theater? She said, no, we just went yesterday to see that movie that was quoted. So then we had the connection back with the documentation to the linguistics, back to the cipher and then we add in circleville with ann Schwartz having him come there to ohio and write all these letters and then we had kurt baggett do the handwriting analysis number one guy in the nation number one or two in the world and he came back a match using uh his expertise he's been doing this. he's number one by far he's the only individual to testify in all 50 states or give his opinion he's testified in over 12 countries wow. so he is the best of the best so we've opened this door connecting these cases that no one's ever able to do with the forensic database and then using that with the new advancements to get physical evidence that already existed and no one, no one ever realized. Wow. We have literally just shot into the stratosphere. It's, a, <laughs> it's insane. It's crazy. And this just happened. Just like We just went public with our company just in the last four months, almost five months. How have the, the request, how have the numbers changed? How have they grown? <laughs> oh, my gosh. I mean, just today alone, I think we've gotten six phone calls uh, this morning with uh, individuals requesting me to get their case. You know, one, uh, a former police officer that's incarcerated, they believe, uh, was set up, uh, wrongfully convicted. Another one was a grandmother calling about uh, one of her, her uh, sons that was persecuted. Uh, she says persecuted, prosecuted. Um, you know, with a case to where he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. And, you know, law enforcement focused on him. This does happen. Law enforcement can't get narrow-minded. But, you know, my brothers in blues, they're, they're doing what they can uh, with what they have. And it's not like someone's out there with a vendetta or someone's out there uh, that's incompetent. What it is is you get focused on one individual because there's so much evidence that may direct you towards him. He looks like the, the guilty party. And that's happened. Uh, a million times since the beginning of, of crime, I assure you, <laughs> but you have to have that physical, you, you have to have that absolute, you know, irrefutable piece. DNA is one of those, 
you know, the new the new fingerprint, lane print, uh, magnetic fingerprint. There's no denying that. You know, with the software, you put it in, it gets the identifiers or identifications. They call them identifiers now. And, um, you know, the ridge, the swirls, you know, depending on what print it is, it's like that. And there it is. You know, you can't deny it. It, it, it just hands the uh, pers- uh, prosecutor and say, look, here you go. This is it is what it is. So, you know, that it's, it's like uh, we're living in a, an entirely different world than we lived even 10 years ago. Yeah. So. If you're a bad guy, like I said, if you're out there and you think that, you know, haha, I got away with this, again, the, uh, I hope your file doesn't cross my desk because you, if it does, your time is limited, I assure you. Yeah, it's 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 quite possible you, you may be breathing uh, not so free air here in the near future. So, but it's been great, man. This is this is a wonderful feeling. You know, we don't charge any victims families. We do not accept funding from state or federal governments. We're all funded by private investors who have, have viewed the evidence personally, signed NDA, sat down, viewed the evidence, and said, "Holy crap, this is this is this is great." And they've actually funded personal money investing in the company to help these victims. I mean, that's that's a whole other level too. I mean, these people don't don't even know these victims or know mm-hmm. these people personally, and they're putting their money up. They're they're um, you know, hard earned cash to help us help them. And that's, that's great, man. I mean, there's still hope, you know, there's still hope. <laughs> now, Alex, if folks have any questions, would, would like more information about uh, what the cold, cold case consultants can do for them. Uh, what's the best place to, to find more information? Okay. So you can go to online CCCOA, which stands for cold case Consultants of America. Uh, so it's CCCOA.us. Uh, open up our website. You get to see uh, introduce introduction to me, the company, my wife, uh, my wife again, wonderful woman. She was a victim herself. 2004, she was abducted, uh, held for a week, uh, raped, and then dropped on a sidewalk with nothing but a sheet and left for dead. And she recovered, and that fueled her desire. Uh, she became a she joined the Air Force, became a military police officer. Uh, was one of the K9 handlers for Air Force One, and then she transferred from the Air Force to the Army uh, for psyops. And uh, she's just a total ass kicker, you know, and that's, <laughs> I married her, you know, but she, uh, she, her bio's in there, uh, Kurtz is in there, Detective Poins is in there, Joe's, Dr. Voss's, get a little bit of uh, background on us individually, uh, our skill set, what, we're, what our expertise is, what the company does. And uh, there's a little section at the bottom. If you want to contact us, you have a, a case yourself that you feel you're kind of stuck, you know, between a rock and a hard spot or there's not any new leads in law enforcement, you know, is maybe unable to focus on your case, reach out to us. We're here. We're, we're looking to, um, to make a dent in this Mount Everest of a quarter million cases, one case at a time. And, uh, that's what we're here for. And let us know. There you go. Well, Alex, it has been great to have the chance to visit with you, sir. You, you opened some eyes and, uh, hopefully we can catch up again real soon. I would love to be back, Cameron. I really appreciate it. I want to let you know it's people like you that are making this possible. Uh, reaching out, you know, with the BR, getting us in here, letting the listeners hear what's going on, give them the facts, not opinions, not assumptions. Let them know, uh, you know, the core of all this. It's people like you that are making that available. And I want to thank you. You know, the victims' families, thank you. The only many times I've gotten off these interviews and spoken to the families, and they've said, you know, tell this individual thank you. You know, dude, this really means a lot. So you're, you're part of this too, man, just to let you know. I appreciate that. Appreciate that, right. Alex. Good to visit with you, brother. It's a uh, pleasure. It's been all mine. Uh, get in touch with us, and we'll we have a couple of major releases coming up. Maybe we'll we'll drop one on your uh, on your podcast. Well, thanks again for joining us for this 156th episode in season two of Good Questions with Cameron Dole. If you ever have a comment, question, or anything else you'd like to know, you can hit me up on the contact page at gqwithcam.com. You can also find me on Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, and Facebook at GQ with Cam. If you'd like to help out in the funding for this podcast, you can visit our merch store where we've got hoodies, tumblers, mugs, shirts, stickers, backpacks, and more. That's gqwithcam.com forward slash shop. And if you have a special guest idea, email me, Cameron, at GQWithCam.com. Well, thanks again to our good friend, Brandon Allen, for coming up with our theme music. We're going to let him play us out and hope you guys have a great rest of your evening.